I've always said to people getting into coding for the first time, it is much easier to get into good habits from the start than it is to break out of bad habits later on. And one of the best habits that you can get into is writing clean code. In fact, you could argue that keeping your code clean is about as important as keeping your teeth clean. If you've already picked up some bad habits, it's not too late to ditch them. So this video is perfect for you as well. In this video, I'll be showing you five tips to make your code cleaner and to keep it clean as well. But before we get into all that, let me talk to you about a service called Codecrafters. Codecrafters is a service that provides programming challenges and its use to you will largely depend on your skill level. The challenges are tailored to your skill level, meaning that if you're looking to learn a language, it will give you more help. But if you already know the ins and outs of the language, it'll be more advanced and more of a challenge for you. The challenges themselves revolve around looking to build your own system. So you can build your own Docker or build your own Git or build your own Redis and learn how these systems work. For example, recently I completed the build your own Docker one and I learned so much about subprocess. And I also learned about how Docker containers keep all their stuff away from the rest of the system. Some of the challenges are free for a limited time, but if you do decide to sign up to the full experience, you can use my link in the description below for a whopping 40% off your first year. Again, that's my link in the description below for 40% off your first year with Codecrafters. But with all that out of the way, let's get into some good habits. So the first trick in this video is to reduce nesting wherever possible and keep code flat, as you'll see in a bit. Uh, so in this example here, we have this function that checks if something is a val. If, uh, or checks a character is a val. If we have just passed a single character, then we check if it's a val. And if it is, we return true. Otherwise we return false. If we have more than one or less than one character passed through, then we, you know, raise an error that we uh, expected a single character. And if we run this, wow, that terminal's wide. Okay, that was weird. Uh, if we run this, da, 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 like that, we can see that it works fine. A is a val, B is not. It works perfectly fine. But it's not the cleanest. You know, we have uh, this nesting, we have this if else level here, and then we have this nesting inside this. Uh, and this is what I mean when I say nesting. You want to keep things as flat as possible. And when I say that, I mean, you want to unindent things as much as possible. So the first thing we can do about this is that we can actually change the order of operations here. So we can say, instead of if len character equals one, we can say if it doesn't equal one, then we raise this error. And then instead of having an else here, we could just unindent this. Because if we do, you know, run into this condition and we'll raise the error, the function will exit. It won't continue on. Uh, and so we don't need to have an else block because it's not necessary. And the same thing happens here, actually. We can get rid of this too. So now we say if, uh, you know, character dot lower in uh, this string here, then we return true. Otherwise, we return false. We've gotten rid of more nesting and we could see it works exactly the same. Uh, when you do something like this, it's typically the case that you would um, pick off all your negative cases. So in this case, we could do something like this, so yeah, false, and then swap that round equals true. And now we're saying if the length of character does not equal one, then we raise. If it's not a vowel, we return false. If it, And then, you know, if all the negative cases aren't true, then it must be the positive case and we return true. That is the general flow you would expect. And again, it works the same. In this particular example, we can actually make this even simpler and we can get rid of the second if statement completely. So we can say instead, return char.lower in a, a E I O U. And because this expression will return a Boolean, what we're saying here is that we just want to return the result of this. So this will either return true or false. So we don't actually need that if statement at all. And then we can see it works, you know, still works exactly the same. And we've reduced our function from eight lines to five, and we've also flattened it an awful lot. You can't get any more flat than this. Another advantage of working like this is that you have more real estate to work with. So if you have um, line length restrictions, then you're less likely to meet them if you unindent more. Because each time you unindent, it gives you four spaces. If you work for Google, that'd be two. Uh, but you just have more space to work with as well. The second tip I want to show you is reducing code redundancy or having some reusable code in place of code that you're defining on multiple places. 
Now there are a number of ways of dealing with this, one of which is decorators. I'm not going to show those off in this video because I've done a string of videos that have covered decorators in recent weeks, so I'd recommend going and watching those, especially the, the main decorators one I did um, a little while ago. But I am going to be showing a concept called mix-ins today, which are sort of the class equivalent. So you'll see here we have this profile class and we have this cube class. They both you know, function relatively similar in the way that they're defined at the very least. You know, they both you know, take attributes and they both set attributes. I'm aware you could use a data class to do the same thing, but for the sake of having an, an easy, simple example, we're not using data classes right now. And you'll notice that both have this string representation method and they both do pretty much the same thing. So they have this class name, you have the open brackets, and then they define, so the name and the age in this case, and the width, the height, and the depth in this case. And we have a little bit of code down here to just create some instances and then print the string representations of each. If we do that, we'll see that we get this format back where you know we have the format that we've defined here. But it is a little bit wasteful to define this twice in each class because if we change it in one class then we might forget to change it in another and actually adding it to each class individually especially when it comes to something like this having to type all this out manually is just a bit annoying and a bit of a nightmare so what we can do is we can create a class that implements that functionality so i'm going to get rid of this and i'm going to get rid of this and i'm going to come up to the top here and I'm going to define a class called Repper Mixin. I'm going to ignore that for now. Now, mixins, despite their name, are just normal classes. There is absolutely nothing special about them at all. It is just utilizing inheritance to add attributes or methods to existing classes. One thing that you could say makes a mixin a mixin is that mixins are useless on their own. If you were to instantiate them, it you know they probably wouldn't do anything useful. Otherwise, it would be just a normal base class. Uh, so we're going to define a wrapper here, and then we're going to do self, and then this is going to return a string. And then we're going to say atres here. So we're going to dynamically generate this list. And actually, we have, yep, yeah, that looks pretty good to me. Uh, and then we can do that. Yeah, that looks, I think that's fine. Uh, so we have a comma separated list where we have the key and the value, and then the string representation of the value the kv in vars self. So vars self is equivalent to self.dict. So we're just getting the dictionary items from the class and we're just cycling through the items. And then we're just formatting uh, the string as we want. So type self.name will get the name of the class itself. And then we could just format our actress into there. And if I bring repper mix in into these two, like that, if we run that code again, we can see that it does exactly the same thing, but we've only defined this string representation once. And now if we change it here, it'll change everywhere. So if we decide to separate them with a pipe, for example, it will change it across both classes and we won't you know, potentially accidentally forget to change it in the cube class. We've changed it in the profile class and it just makes it a bit more, um, a bit more consistent. With this particular implementation, if your classes had slots, you'd want to do something slightly different. You'd want to you know, detect if it had slots or dicks and then do it like that. I haven't done that here for simplicity. Uh, you would also, or you could also do it as a meta class if you wanted to in this particular instance. I have a video on meta classes that I did a while ago if you want to know about those. Um, and meta classes work actually quite similarly in terms of reducing code redundancy. Uh, so they're another method you can do. I just wanted to show mixins off today uh, because I haven't actually talked about mixins on the channel before and I just wanted to show them off because they're a really cool concept. The third trick that I want to show you today is reducing complexity within functions. So potentially splitting out codes um, into more than one function if one is looking particularly complex. Uh, so this is uh, a an excerpt from the code I wrote in my OAuth video, doing it OAuth from scratch. And you could potentially argue that me using my own explanatory code as a, an example of what not to do <laughs> is a bit counterproductive. Uh, but it is also an example of you may or may not want to split it out. It depends on your exact use case. It depends because, you know, you have your function call overheads. So you may or may not want to split certain things out. That would be up to your discretion. But I wanted to use this as an example because I think it's quite a good example of how you could split 
an awful lot of code out because this is you know quite a long function into multiple different functions so we can define three separate kind of sections in this so we have this section which requests our authorization we then have this section that fetches the code from the authorization server and then we have this section that actually fetches the tokens and we could split this out into three uh, separate functions. So if I were to do, <laughs> do an is val again, uh, if I were to do request auth, oops, it might, no, uh, authorization. And then we have secrets. And then we also want to pass in our redirect URI in here. And then we want to return a dict string to string. That's fine. And then we want to leave our redirect URI out because we want to share this across functions. We could just move this in here and then put that there. And then if we want to return, we'll need to return the params because we need that later. We define these params in here. Again, if you're unsure what's happening in this in this code except exactly, then you can go and watch that OAuth video to find out. Uh, but we could simply say that our params equals request, oh, I misspelled the function, I just realized. Request authorization, there we go. And now we've taken, what is this, 11 lines of code out and moved them in here. If we wanted to fetch the code, I'll create the function first, uh, we can do def fetch code, and then we need the params in here, which is why we need to return them out. And then we can simply move this out and put it into here. We can then return this and say that our code equals fetch code params. And then the same thing here. So we have def fetch tokens, and then that is a secrets. These are secrets, a code, and the redirect URI. Uh, and then we move, we can just move this out, put it in here. We could say that we just want to return fetch token secrets, redirect URI, and then code. And now we can see that this authorized method has been reduced from, I don't know how many lines it was before actually, quite a large number down to five. And that's because we split it out into different sections. So we can now see, if we were to look at this code, we would see, oh, we're requesting authorization, we're fetching the code, and then we're fetching the tokens. Of course, you could do the same thing with comments if you wanted to, or a doc string. Um, but this will just reduce complexity of individual functions. And that may or may not be something you want to do. It depends on the circumstance, really. If you have a function that is a few hundred lines long, then you might want to split it out just for the sake of readability. Though it is a fine balance between uh, introducing the performance overhead of calling these additional functions. In the case of this authorized method, you're probably not going to be calling this that much. So you could arguably say that splitting the function out to make it more readable is the better solution. Further to splitting out a function into multiple functions, you can also split a file into multiple files, and this is the topic of tip number four. Now, there are some caveats to that, again, but I'll talk about those in the end. So we could, potentially, in this particular instance, we could, if we wanted to, take these two classes and move them out into their own file, keep them separated, and then just import them in. So that's what we're going to do here. So we're going to create auth server.py. We're going to go back in here. We're going to get rid of these, and then we're going to uh take our imports and we're going to move them in as well do, 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 do. Uh, we'll take that from url lib.pars import pars qsl i did copy that didn't paste it <laughs> what do you do and then we need to do from auth uh server import server and now we have this server functionality in here but the actual definitions are in another file. It does also work the other way as well in that you can split files out too far and then people are you know, scrabbling around trying to look for things. So if this file was significantly shorter and some people may actually believe, um, or, you know, maybe we're looking at this and thinking, God, these, these classes should be in this file. Or maybe they should. In smaller files, especially if you've got a Python package index, which maybe exposes a function or two and maybe a class, then you would want to keep it in one file just so people aren't searching through a full directory tree to find these things. And the rule that I have about splitting things into multiple files, and this is just my own rule, 
uh, would be that you need to promote a healthy but not excessive separation of concerns. So if you know if there is enough complex logic, then you should split into files in such a way that each file has a particular purpose. So a much larger example is my analytics library. I keep going back to this because it's my own project and of course I'm going to flog it wherever possible. But inside this analytics folder is the actual code. And there is quite a lot going on here. So you have the client, you have the authorization, you have your errors, you have your mix-ins, you have your queries, uh, shards, utils, UX. But you'll notice that each of these files has a particular purpose. So client.py is all the clients, auth.py is everything to do with authorization. And this just makes things a lot easier to find. So if I wanted to find the client class, I could come in here. And you'll notice that the client class is 892 lines long on its own. So at that point, yes, you would definitely want to split out into multiple files. What you could do though, to clean something up even more is utilize the init.py files. And these allow you to import, say the client into the init.py file. And instead of having to do from analytics.client import client, I can simply now do from analytics import client. So it's as if it's in the same file, but it is separated out into multiple files and you can bring them in using the init and create this consistent and easy to use API for the user. So it is a case of using your intuition to work out whether or not it's cleaner to keep things in one file or whether it's cleaner to keep things in a series of files, but it's also down to your usage of what's available to you, such as the init.py stuff um, to be able to create consistent and user-friendly APIs. The fifth and final tip for this video is simply just use Pep8. There is no excuse not to. Uh, I said in the beginning of this video, and I'll say it again, it is much easier to get into good habits than it is to break out of bad ones. And Pep8 is the best habit that you can get into early. And the best thing about it is that you don't really have to think about it at all. In modern day Python, there are plenty of tools to do it for you. So if I go on the Python package index and search black, we'll have black there. Uh, this is a you know, a code formatter that formats using Pep8 style. There is iSort, which sorts all of your imports alphabetically and in Pep8 format, which is really nice. Uh, there's also linters, so you've got things like rough, which can actually do iSorts and black's job. I wouldn't necessarily use the formatter today. I don't think it's production ready because it conflicts with the linter and to me that screams not production ready. But rough is there, it's very quick. It can find all of these things and help you make, and it could do auto fix as well actually. So it can make your code very Pepe compliant very quickly. The perfect Python series, which this video is a part of, is literally dedicated to talking about all of these different tools that can help you do this. So I'll link the series in the end cards and I'll, I'll put it elsewhere as well. So you can have a look at all those videos, some of which dating back a very long time. So you can see younger me if you really wanted to. So there is literally no reason to not follow Pepe standards. I would recommend just having a quick read through uh, Pep8 if you haven't already, just to get an idea of you know what's good and what's not. Obviously, if you code yourself using Pep8 standards, then that's even better. But you see, you know, you know, a few times in this video, even I haven't followed Pep8 myself, and the tools have automatically come to my rescue because you can just let them do that. So those are five cool tips and tricks to help keep your code clean in Python. Let me know in the comments which ones are your favorites, which ones you know already, which ones you just learned today. It'd be really interesting to know. As I said before, if you wanna know more about any of these tools or you wanna keep up with how to keep your Python code perfectly clean, then I do have an entire series dedicated to it. So I recommend looking at the videos in those, but I'll see you next time for whatever we do next. Oh, it tastes nice though. <laughs> Still got some toothpaste on it.